Hello guys and welcome to today's course, Skills to Negotiate. Um, I will be your host for today. Um, my name is Kevin O'Shea, also known as Coach O'Shea. And you have joined us today to learn about negotiation. So just before we kick off, um, I would like to make sure that anybody who is studying this course from at home or in work or in a certain location... Um, make sure that you are in a quiet place, make sure that you have a pen and paper, which is super important, uh, and also make sure that you have your phone on silent or in a separate room. That's going to be really, really important for you to concentrate on this course here. Now, we do also have this course in a live um, a practical course for two to three days depending on the amount of people um, so that's something that you can look at after completing the course to see how you get on okay also I'd like to mention if you have questions as I'm going to be recording this and as I am recording this make sure and pause the video pause the recording pause the animation to make sure that you can write down your question and check to see if I've actually answered that by the end of the course Okay, I will try my best to reply to everybody as soon as possible if you send me questions, but please be sure to make sure that they're relevant to the course here. If you do want to send any questions, send them to contactcoachoshea at gmail.com. Everybody should have that email at this stage, but if not, it's contactcoachoshea at gmail.com. And also, just before we kick off, just so everybody knows, some of these um, slides that I'm going to go through on the deck here, I will be taking my time, mainly, um, I suppose, uh, just in case some people are unaware, a lot of this material is going to be translated either by myself or somebody else on the team, so I do have to take my time with the language, because a lot of people, um, English is not their first language, so we're going to be translating the course also. So um, apologies for that, but if you have any questions beyond also what we're speaking about, you can contact me on Instagram or you can send me an email also to contact uh, Coach O'Shea and just put it in the uh, in the subject matter and I can answer more questions beyond this course. But today, let's just focus on skills to negotiate, okay? And not let's not focus on the with Coach O'Shea part, okay? So let's skip on here and see how we get on. Okay, everybody ready? Make sure, obviously, phone's in the next room. You have your notepad. I always advise people about the notepad because it's essential, but I tend to take a fierce amount of notes. With you guys, it's super easy because you can just pause at any time and, uh, and you can write your notes. Okay, so look, let's kick off. Super. So this is the game plan for today, okay? So it's important that we kind of make a plan about, I suppose, just to make it clear for you guys. So just before I'm going to, like you can see this slide, but just before I discuss what, what's in this slide, I'd really like people to take note of what their expectations are for today. So is there a certain reason that you said, okay, I'm going to contact Coach O'Shea, I'm going to get some material, I'm going to go on a course, I've seen him speak, I've seen just the title that I'm interested in, I want to learn about negotiation, just make sure that you write down what you expect to gain from today's course. Um, maybe some suggestions, so let's say like, okay, um, I would like to be better at negotiation in my current employment so that I can make more sales, so that I can negotiate a better contract for um, for my employment so I can build my career and put it on my CV. There's many different reasons that people would like to negotiate. Sometimes it's for a relationship, <laughs> you know, so there's so many different reasons. And also like it could be for purchase, like you may be a business owner and it could be just for purchasing more product that you actually sell already, but you just want to negotiate with a different country because a lot of the material that we're covering is like focused at the moment it's mainly focused on people who are using uh, negotiation skills but in a second language so it's not actually just in English it's in other languages also and that's kind of uh, one of the main focuses for the last few months um, with this course so it could absolutely be that situation you need to deal with people um, with different culture backgrounds and you want to learn to be the best uh, person you can uh, when it comes to negotiation okay 
and just kind of before I kick off on, on the plan, like that is kind of, um, how would you say, that is like the kind of bones, like I suppose the structure to being good at negotiation would be being prepared. So like having practiced what you wish to say, having practiced different types of questioning styles or different types of um, difficult questions. Do you know, like there's many courses that we do here um, and we like discuss like for interview, let's say, just let's stick with interview because it's uh, super easy. So like interview process and so on is can be daunting. It could be like, oh, I don't want to go for an interview with a certain company. I'm not going to label companies uh, on the, the video or sorry, on the, the recording. But let's say I go for a very large company. I'm going for an interview. I may have six to seven stages in that interview process. The better I am at negotiation skills actually equips me with very solid skills when it comes to presenting myself and also understanding what the person is talking about. Lots of people get lost in many scenarios where they, like I mentioned about interview being daunting, they get overly nervous and they're not necessarily listening to what the the person is saying or where they're speaking from. So let's say um, somebody asked me a question and they may say, uh, why are you going for this position or what brought you uh, to me today? So just very vague, very broad question just to see where my my head is at for the day. And I might take an absolute tangent and say, oh, I just decided, I seen it online, I wasn't sure. But I might have a huge reason, I just haven't thought about it. What is the reason I'm sitting there today, do you know? So the stuff that we're going to go through today will be essential uh, as a toolkit to help you negotiate. It's not going to make it like, I can't say to you, okay, I know absolutely everything when it comes to this. Um, these are going to be the tools and the keys that you're going to need to negotiate and get a, a more money in work or um, buy a car for 50 for 50% off. Okay, I can teach you to do that, but it's not going to work every time, you know. So these things are tried and tested, but it really depends on you and the work that you put in. Okay, so let's just look at the plan. Let's stick with this for those for, for the moment. So here on the slide, it says... In this course, we will cover a range of tools. So like I mentioned, we discussed that these are going to be tools that you can use, but lots of them can be used for other things, okay? So they're, they're from other um, courses that we've done, but they all uh, relate and are very, very much utilized when you're negotiating. So um, in this course, we will cover a range of tools that will be paramount to being a successful negotiator, okay? so super important obviously to be successful it is actually quite difficult a lot of it has to do with confidence but also knowing how to do it so there's different um what would you say like different levels or different tiers in a conversation so i'm going to teach you about that today um and once you begin to role play these tools and begin using them like keys to open doors i can guarantee you will surprise yourself so that's 100 percent. i can absolutely guarantee that you will surprise yourself when you begin to use these, if you, like use these, uh, I suppose I'll just finish my sentence, use these keys um, to open more doors in work or open more doors in a situation or open more doors in the next time that you need to negotiate, okay? One major thing is just before we kind of go into everything, be conscious that don't try, if you're already negotiating or you're already a salesperson, you're already working in management and working as a director and you need to meet clients and you need to meet different companies that want to be involved and stakeholders, everything, like board meetings every day of the week, things like that, okay? So all of those have kind of inklings into negotiation. If you already negotiate, please do not change everything that you're doing right now and think that this is going to be the best way forward. That is the opposite of what I want you to do. It's not saying that I don't want you to try these things out. I absolutely do. But please be sure to know that you're in employment, okay? So let's say, for instance, that you are, some people aren't, but if you are in employment right now and you're looking to upskill with negotiation skills, fantastic. But if that's the case, you already have employment, so it doesn't mean that you have to change in everything that you're doing right now to what I'm going to say to you today and what we're going to discuss so just try to change some things because what you'll actually, it's in a different course, but what you'll know um, if you've studied um, 
negotiation before or just even training for people if you alter everything that the person is doing automatically you're going to have a huge curve down because the person is going to get super frustrated because things aren't going to work the same it's like starting a new job even though you know what you're doing you're in a different role and it just gets very frustrating so the person's self is actually on a downscale which makes it much more difficult to have 100% success okay so just be sure make sure don't change everything tomorrow when you go back to work um, or today or this afternoon just be sure to know the stuff and study the stuff that we talk about today and if you have any questions like I said in the previous slide please ask me okay just send me an email if I don't reply send me another email okay no worries Super. Okay, so we know the game plan. We're going to find some tools. I'm going to discuss them with you today. We're going to make sure that we are going to surprise yourself because some of these skills, when you see yourself using them, or another thing that actually a client told me about, um, was it two years ago or something? We were discussing something and then I said something and then they noted something that I was doing in the conversation that it was something that we had discussed in a course that day. So we went for lunch afterwards. We were talking about something else. But in the conversation, they related something from the course that I was doing in the conversation. Okay, so this is super important. If you can spot people using certain styles of questioning, um, if they're using certain types of body language or they're testing your body language, lots of people do this subconsciously and they're just naturally good at certain things. So just keep an eye on those things after uh, we finish the course. Okay, so let's carry on to the next slide. Okay. Super. First impressions. Very, very important. It like it's like it's like an old tale. It's like, oh geez, make sure wear wear a suit going into your interview and make sure that you present yourself super well. And it's absolutely correct. You do need to present yourself well. It is not just for being a good negotiator that you need to present yourself well. No way. It's for all actions and sections of life that you need to present yourself and even present uh, this is more deeper into the coaching side of things but presenting yourself to yourself is also super important but that's for another day uh, right now what I want to look at is literally the first impression the first time that you meet somebody it roughly takes about seven seconds for the person that you meet for the first time to make a subconscious impression of who they believe you are like a stereotype they're going to start relating who they believe you are even if you don't even speak in seven seconds okay roughly about seven seconds depending on the person and the intelligent level but roughly it's about seven seconds so this is just to give you scale and the kind of uh, I suppose on, on the time that it takes for them to kind of preempt who they believe you are okay so imagine you have seven seconds okay I'm trying to think of something that takes seven seconds um, but it even if you just timed it on your watch and just looked at seven seconds past, that's probably a good idea. So if you just take your watch and have a look at the clock, you probably have a watch in your left hand or right hand. I generally wear it on my left. So just have a look at your watch right now, okay? If you have it on your iPhone or your phone, please take out your phone and just have a look. I know um, your phone's on silent because you're very good, but please just have a look at seven seconds pass if you can. Now that is the amount of time that it would take for somebody to make an impression of you okay so all these things that you've done all your life all these things you've lovely things on your cv and you've managed to become um, an entrepreneur or run two or three businesses at one time and been very successful fantastic a parent you know loads of different things but somebody is going to actually make an opinion of you in seven seconds okay so what do you have to your advantage in this circumstance is mainly knowledge okay because what we're going to discuss now is the percentage of what they're actually taking in when they see you for the first time okay so visually okay so the visual percentage of what they take in in the first impression in this scenario of the first impression 55 percent 55 percent is visual okay so this is down to what they're seeing obviously which is visual body language and facial expressions okay so body language facial expressions as we can see on the slide um you know you can go farther you can look at clothes different things like that okay but for now we're just going to focus on body language and facial expressions so think about before you started the 
uh, or let's say actually this is a quite a good one. So let's say uh, you're on a video call or a video chat um, with your company. The face that you put on before you answer a call, let's say Microsoft Teams or on Zoom or uh, one of those other companies, and you let's say open a call, but the face that you had on before you answered or the face when you go to a call and the person isn't there. Can you imagine the face that you have on? Not the face that you have on, but the facial expression that you're making. Because generally, you can actually see the reflection on your comp uh, your PC if um, if it's dark and you're waiting for somebody to join the call. Next time you do that, have a look at the face. Because it's actually quite funny because there's nobody there. So you're not actually, let's say, faking it. But you're not putting on a huge smile unless you're um, smiling all day long staring at your computer. But before this call, make sure next time, have a look at your facial expression. Very, very important task, okay? So visually, 55% of the impression that they take is actually from body language and facial expression. So this is something that we need to get correct because it's over half, okay? Vocal is 38%, okay? So the way we say something, okay? And uh, it says inflection in our voice, okay? So there's other things that we will, um, I suppose we won't do them today. Um, I can discuss how to do them, I suppose. Um, but um, on the the practical course where we do it for two or three days, um, this is where we actually do vo voice projection, okay? This is super important for clarity in what you're saying. So for those of you who speak um, English but not as a uh, as like as a second language or a third language or a fourth language even for some of the people um, just be sure to uh, record yourself maybe if it's something you're going on to a call practice with a friend practice with a native speaker of whatever language if it's Portuguese like uh, uh, what I do I actually do calls with uh, people I know that are obviously from Brazil or depending if I'm dealing with people um, in Portugal um, I will speak to friends and discuss the language that I need to use to make sure that it sounds clear and it sounds well, okay? It might sound like overkill, but I find it very, very important because it's actually the way you say something. It's not necessarily um, how you say it because here we say verbal is 7%, okay? The words that we actually say, so like the construct of the language, like for me, I speak Irish, I speak English, and I speak Portuguese, okay? Um, um, I was about to say for now, because I was thinking about uh, learning another language, but um, the words that we actually say are like the construct of the language isn't super important when it is the way that we say something. So like your tone of voice, okay? Your tone of voice is super important. If you're discussing something with somebody and you want to feel empath or show empathy with the person, you're not going to start shouting at them or and I start raising your voice and start really, oh my God, I'm really excited or, oh, Jesus, this is not very good at all. You know, it, it really depends on how you say something, like the way you're saying it, not necessarily what you're saying. So this isn't like going to like cover the whole course, but it's just to be conscious of the difference of what the person is actually taking on board. So 93% is actually not what you're saying. Okay. So for me, I put this in there mainly because it's a super surprise and, and it's very, um, not influential, but it just helps you kickstart focusing on other things not just uh, the words that we're actually saying okay so let's move on happy enough any questions at all please make sure they write them down if also that you have a question about one of the slides make sure and write it down okay you can just pause the video no problem okay super okay let's go to the next slide Okay, similar to what we briefly discussed on the last slide, this is common pitfalls when making a first impression, okay? The first impression part, like I know most people think it's like the first time that you meet somebody. It can also be the second time they meet somebody. It could be the time that you've spoke to them for like many people I meet or people that we coach. Like... Uh, they're dealing with clients for six months or they're dealing with clients overseas. They're dealing with clients that are on Zoom or they're dealing with clients just over the phone. They haven't actually seen them and then they see them. This is a second like version of the uh, first impression 
many people after the pandemic, obviously, um, which is something I'm going to speak about now as well when it comes to body language, but after the pandemic, um, some people went back to work. Okay, and recently people have been going back to work. Even a friend of mine hadn't been in, like I think he's worked, um, I'm not gonna name the company, but he's worked there for two years, but he hasn't actually been in the building. <laughs> and I think it was yesterday, or I think it was yesterday or the day before that he went in for the first time to meet his colleagues. He's only seen them on Zoom. I think 50 to 60%, he's only talked to them over the phone. So this is a first impression, even though it's not the first encounter with these people. Okay, so just be conscious of that. So not just the first time, maybe the second time you meet somebody or maybe a different circumstance. You're either on Zoom or you're going to meet them in a meeting or you're going to meet them with um, higher ranking people in the company. Okay, so this is also uh, different because people will act different in different uh, environments. This is like 100% um, very important thing to, to keep an eye on. Okay, so let's discuss what we see on the slide. We have to be aware that a lot of this is going to be translated, so I will read from the slide. So common pitfalls, okay? Closed arms. Now, closed arms, can you think, just for a second, think about who is working all day long, let's say all day long, but let's say for their um, hours of work, and they keep their arms folded. Can you think of anybody who does that? So let's think of, um, let's say, a bodyguard, um, a bouncer, so somebody who works as security on a door. Now, if we're talking about first impressions, okay, and you want to discuss somebody who you want to be, I suppose if it's talking about yourself, you want to be inviting conversation because you want to discuss something with the person, you want to be open to conversation. Do you want to have closed body language? I think 100% the number one closed body language is crossing your arms in a lot of cases. There is other things um, farther into body language where you can discuss to kind of, I suppose, battle against that that statement. But mainly when somebody closes their arms, the person subconsciously is believing this person is retracting themselves from the conversation or closing themselves off. So here we are, whether crossed in front or tight by your side. So like kind of, making yourself uh, somewhat closed. You are sending the message, I'm unapproachable. Okay, loosen up, bend the elbows and relax. Simple, straight to the point. If you come across relaxed, the other person is gonna be relaxed. This is gonna make a negotiation so much easier. If you can make the person comfortable, I mentioned earlier about people acting different in different uh, environments. This is the same thing. If you loosen up, generally the other person will also do so because they almost feel allowed, okay? So please, please do that. So let's move to the right, okay? So continuous nodding. This is one that I get given out to. So continuous nodding, we do this to let people know we are listening. But it can be misinterpreted, uh, a scoop, uh, misinterpreted as agreement, okay? Now, this is very, very true because this has happened to me. Um, It's probably happened to many of you before, depending, like if anybody works as a trainer or a coach or worked in psychology, work as a doctor, um, like it's very common that I find myself that I'm nodding at somebody. Uh, And also if if somebody's learning a new language, just be conscious of nodding all the time. But for me as a coach and working uh, in learning development, I tend to coach and analyze people when I'm discussing something with them because obviously I'm trying to help them so I want to learn not just what they're talking about but where they're speaking from so I need to really concentrate on not just what they're saying but the things that they're doing how they're standing and also the 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 topics that they're discussing so these are really important but I need to keep the person talking you know so one really easy way to keep people talking is to nod in agreement, the person is going to love this. They're going to absorb much more uh, about what you're talking about, which is going to make it super, super easy um, for you to get more information. The more information you have, you have a better assessment. So this is one thing that I have a massive pitfall. So that's me, definitely. Nodding all the time, being like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. And just nodding slightly. But like, I don't nod at a 45 degree angle up and down. Do you know, I literally have these tiny mini nods, okay? 
it could be from the old vintage sales um the yes rolling if you've heard of that before um because I would have learned that uh, a good few years ago and I don't do it anymore. Now I'm quite conscious when others are doing it, but some people do it subconsciously. But for me, it's always to keep the person talking so I can learn about them, but it can be misunderstood. I'm not necessarily agreeing with them, but because it looks like I'm agreeing, they're going to keep talking. But if it's a negotiation and the person thinks I'm agreeing, maybe that's not the best move. Okay, so you can read that um, here on the second point. Now, let's go to the third point. Failure to make eye contact. Massive pitfall. Massive. Absolutely massive. So, let's read from the slide here. Looking past or around somebody makes you seem disengaged. Absolutely. Now, some people are surprised by this, but 65% or less is considered good eye contact. 100%. Now, the simple reason for that just because 65%, like it seems like quite a bit, like, you know, but if you go farther, the person is going to feel like you are staring at them. If somebody is staring at you really intently, you're not really going to feel too comfortable, I would believe, okay, Do you know, you're not going to be, um, you, you know, nobody wants to feel like an animal at a zoo, do you know, we do lots of different coaching and teaching for people to do speeches and seminars and so on. Like one of the things they talk about is people just staring at you. It's like, absolutely, they're going to stare at you. They're going to look at you. Like, you know, but just be conscious. Like people talk about spotlight syndrome, different things like that. But just be be conscious that if you overdo it, people will actually feel uncomfortable. And there is people I know that are like super good at having really good eye contact. But sometimes they do look too often. Uh, and I've said that to people and they haven't realized because they just don't blink that often. And it just depends on the person. But just be conscious that overdoing it is going to be taken up really badly. Okay. But underdoing it just so much. If you don't look at the person enough, they're going to think you're distracted. You're not listening to what they're saying. You're kind of trying to do something else or trying to make attention on something else more so than what they're talking about. Similar to the continuous nodding, you're agreeing in a sense subconsciously with the person by nodding be taken up the wrong way but you're trying to let the person know that you're super happy with what they're talking about and you want them to keep going same if you stop looking at the person they're going to be like okay they're here they're not ready to keep listening let's just stop talking about whatever that i'm talking about and maybe i'm speaking about soup something really important so to be super conscious of this guys okay so the eye contact one it's one that you can practice but just be aware next time that you are in a conversation just think about it Please don't go into a negotiation scenario or in sales or pitching something where you're conscious of eye contact. Just because most of the time when people do that, anytime I've done it in the past, it's always come down to staring. So just don't overdo it. <laughs> um, any questions on that one, you can give me a shout. On the day um, um, for the live, the live course, we're doing two or three days, um, we will be discussing this and we will be practicing this. But there's a couple of different ways you can do it um super okay so number four slouching so let's just read what it says and then we can discuss slouching this body language expresses our lack of desire to be in the situation let alone in the conversation okay so lean toward your colleague to show interest so i wrote this in but i'm still conscious of what it can be interpreted like so slouching obviously is a no-no okay you don't want to look bored okay i know people that are definitely not bored and they always have their arm or hand underneath their chin when they're looking at something sometimes people say that in body language that this is presenting yourself to the person presenting your face and so on okay so which is a positive thing but other people call it slouching because you're bending over and you're kind of you're not really you're kind of leaning on your hand you know and so it's kind of you're super relaxed, but it seems that you're you're kind of faded uh, into a different um, uh, room. You're not really listening to the person. But in this circumstance, this is what it's talking about. It's like, you know, making sure that you're up straight and you're in your body language is very kind of um, I don't want to say sharp, but like, you know, you don't want to come across lazy or you don't want to come across that you're kind of, oh, yeah, OK, just brazen into what they're speaking about. And then it says, uh, lean toward your colleague 
uh, to show interest, absolutely lean towards your colleague. Another tell for somebody, if you're purchasing something. So let's say, for instance, if we're doing a large sale, we're selling a new product. It's um, a digital platform that you can use in a workplace and it's super secure. It's really amazing, but it's like a million um, dollars or a million euro, whatever, um, because we're going to keep a contract for 10 years, something like that. Okay. Um, this could take a lot of discussions because we're not a deal with lots of different people in their company okay but let's say we're talking about something and i say oh well i think we should do it for five years and instead of doing the 10 but we do need to keep it at whatever 10 million and they're like okay it sounds good but if they don't say okay that sounds good and they lean forward it's a massive tell for somebody to say, okay, I'm super eager. This is a game I'm, I'm ready to, to sign. Especially if they like lean forward from a sitting position and they end up being, let's say 35, 45% um, or 45 degrees, sorry, angle, like leaning almost on the table. Many people do it. And also if you're doing negotiation, be conscious of doing it in a coffee shop that has a table. I, I know this is a bit kind of off topic from slouching, but it's still uh, very, very important. If you we're doing a negotiation or you were doing a deal or you're discussing a sale or discussing an interview or anything in a coffee shop many coffee shops i'm not going to name them now but and many coffee shops have lovely chairs beautiful but then they have the super low table so you have like four lovely chairs really nice okay but then you have this super low table in between like the generic coffee table but in a coffee shop or in a, uh, a library or in a college or university lots of them have the coffee shop table or sorry the, the the coffee table that you have in your house and these lovely big chairs okay it means you can be super comfortable but it's a very easy place to get a tell if somebody's good at body language and they can see what you're kind of almost see what you're thinking um by the way you move because they can see everything you're doing and especially the slouching or leaning over when somebody gets super comfortable uh they can start getting distracted by things around them tvs and so on are also um, just being kind of um, falling into the chair but also if they're if you're talking about purchasing something and you're the one who's going to purchase and you lean forward drastically after they finish a sentence about a number it's a big tell that you're ready to buy okay so just be conscious of that um, for yourself or also if you're doing it um, uh, in another um in another circumstance with other people like just be conscious if there's four people there two people there there are very much things you need to watch out for okay let's move on to the next point okay so point number five active listening okay be conscious uh, not just to listen to reply to a person or a client this is so important not just to don't just listen to respond straight away it's not really um good for 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 the conversation uh, the key is to listen to understand like I'm, i mentioned this earlier like listen to understand but like try to listen to where this person is speaking from you want to kind of be aware that okay this person is asking me a question it's very difficult or this person has come up with a lovely number it sounds good to me but where is this coming from okay this person is speaking from a certain uh, experience or a, spur, a certain level of intelligence or a uh, a certain level of experience in this um, kind of product circle or what, you know. So they have a background, but just being aware of that is very, very important. And don't be afraid to ask many questions. Obviously, you're not going to um, uh, interrogate the person, but it's important to let the person know. You want to know exactly what they're saying, not just uh, to hear it, you know. You want to make sure, okay, I actually understand what you just said. Okay, so that's really important. OK, uh, and this will work really, really, really well um, for relationship building and for the future. And this is kind of something we'll, we'll discuss um, in the next slide or the slide after. It's just active listening is just incredibly important. And this is one of those things that you can practice. OK, practice it at home with your husband and wife, 100 percent, friends and family. Uh, and also test yourself for like if you're at a party or you're at a birthday or something and just test yourself for what you remember about the new people that you met okay this is something i do with a lot of people i coach um or a lot of people who work in sales or management or or assess other people in um in interview processes stuff like that what do you remember for that from that person and like this is super valuable for your memory and also for your active listening skills okay 
we do have two ears and one mouth. Okay, so it's important to use those. Okay, mine are absolutely massive, so I have a good advantage. <laughs> um, super. Okay, number six, be true. Okay, a lot of the time, I'm just going to read from the slide here now, uh, so you can just have a quick look at the slide. A lot of the time, people tend to create a character rather than be themselves in a negotiation. Okay, so let's go back to my other point when I said about different scenarios, different rooms, different places, people act differently. Cool. Then I explained about people having a first impression and then sometimes you have to make a different type of first impression. So you're actually going to see a person, let's say your manager or your boss or your CEO, whatever, in a circumstance, you have to present yourself to them well enough because they're actually trying to make sure they are also presented well. So they're doing a first impression too. Okay, so this is very, very important. So this is kind of where the character part comes in. And the person will buy into you, not fiction. Very true, okay? So people used to say uh, years ago when we were doing sales, um, like uh, people used to do, like in door to door, they'd be like, oh, follow your lies. Like follow your lies. You know, so like that basically means I don't mind if you lie, just make sure that you don't like lie about something else that makes no sense to the story that you created with your client. <laughs> Sounds quite positive. <laughs> uh, not, it doesn't actually. But so let's say like be true, okay? This is much easier in a negotiation and being honest than it is to sound appealing, okay? So just think about those things. So sounding appealing and being honest. Being honest outweighs it 1,000%. Like a lot of these things, like we could probably go on and talk about more of them, but just think about common pitfalls and now think about common pitfalls because we're used to wearing masks. Because obviously the pandemic that just happened, um, you need to be conscious of the way that you hold yourself and the things that you do with your mouth or chewing gum or your teeth or grinding your teeth. There's lots of different things people have picked up uh, that aren't so amazing um, since the pandemic. So just be conscious of things that you do now without a mask, okay? Um, maybe ask your friends might be a good idea, just in case that there's something that people do. A lot of the time when it comes to, like there's one thing I actually don't have here, which is like, uh, it's not necessarily a nervous tick, but it also is. Lots of people need to have a pen so that they can click it. They want to have like uh, like an item, maybe a book or a notebook or tapping their foot on the ground. Oh my God, the amount of people that I've met that literally don't even realize they're doing it and they've never not done it. Like there was a couple of people that I used to, to work with and I used to get them to use a paper clip. So I just because I used to do so I used to use a paper clip years ago um, in my pocket just because it just felt like I was able to just put all this kind of um, uh, energy into the paper clip rather than um, kind of stuttering my words or finding it difficult to speak to a crowd. Uh, and I also used to like opening and closing a pen in my hand. Okay, so this was really, really helpful. Then I used to move to like a stress ball and a tennis ball just because I used to use it in the in the seminars. But right now, um, I'm just remembering different times that I've said this to people because they used to click a pen. Oh, my dear God. Imagine watching somebody. This is what happened to me and the several occasions watching somebody interview another person for a company, a very large company, but interviewing them while clicking a pen vigorously for 40 minutes on a continuous basis like for me if I was being interviewed that would be super difficult <laughs> to listen to somebody like that just clicking a pen um, and it's very distracting so just think about just in case you have a tick it's not necessarily a tick but it's like something that you do uh, without realizing you're like subconsciously doing it okay or you um, you know you move your leg or you tap your leg when you're nervous these are things that you can train or untrain yourself to do okay but you need to be aware of them okay so speak to people you know Probably people that you trust rather than just random people on the street. And, and uh, yeah, and just ask them and see what they say. If they say nothing, fair play to you. Um, but yeah, let's move on to the next slide, okay? And as I said, make sure any questions, just write them down and uh, we'll make sure to get them. Okay, so key skills of negotiation. So... The question probably should be at the bottom um, because we're going to discuss the different things, but should be really at the bottom. But let's 
take the first piece here. Okay, it, it does say, is there anything else you would add? So I suppose before we get into them, maybe pause the video and write down anything that you feel would be essential for um, essential skills to be a good negotiator, okay? Just pause the video, take a minute, rather than looking at the slide, we're all adults, just take a moment uh, and do that. Because then we can kind of refer back to what we're doing here and see if we're all on the same page. Super. Okay, so now that you've done that, now let's look at what we have here in the slides. So, key skills of negotiation. Communication, okay? So, communication, 100%. These are things that you can practice, you can get better at. Like obviously, um, I didn't start my career making courses and teaching and coaching, Do you know. I started in other industries and over time, it became something that I found I was able to help people at, help people with, excuse me. Uh, communication is essential and it can be worked on, okay? Now, identification of non-verbal cues, okay, so similar to what we just mentioned. If somebody is sitting at a table in those uh, coffee shops that we're not gonna mention, but they have the fancy chair and they have the small coffee table, okay? I hope to God, you, I shouldn't really put a picture in, but I hope you can uh, you can imagine what I'm talking about. So you have the small coffee table. You have the huge chairs, there's four of them there, there's four people in a meeting. Now, I can pick up non-verbal cues very easily because I've done it for a long time, but anybody else can also pick up the non-verbal cues subconsciously definitely in that scenario because they can see the full body very easily uh, in the conversation and everybody's acting comfortable. So nonverbal cues identification is super, super important. Now, this is something you can pra practice with a friend, okay? Or you can preempt something. So you'll find some people will be... Or in, I'm just trying to think of a good way. You could probably watch a film without the sound and try to understand what's going on and then watch it with the sound. Even if you did it for 25 minutes, 25 minutes is probably a good number to watch it for and then test out to see if you actually understood what was going on, but just from the body language. Yeah, so I would say check that out for, for a task. Now, be engaging. Now, this is different because some people find it super difficult to speak to a crowd. I've worked with many different types of people. Some people are artists, some people are doctors and they're trying to do a lecture <clears throat> excuse me uh, and they're trying to do a lecture but they're just super highly intelligent and they don't like people so they just want to talk um to them to like on recording but they don't want to speak to a live environment okay so there is ways you can be engaging and it may be just the material you know or your presence let the people know like it's very engaging when somebody says to me okay like if i was doing a i was interviewing somebody and they started asking me questions but they're not somebody who um, is like outgoing or maybe not as kind of, I'm not saying, I'm saying I'm loud, but not saying like kind of not as outgoing maybe as me. And they're like very quiet and timid, but they ask good questions. This is engaging. Okay, so there's different formats for engaging. Okay, so just be engaging and be involved in the conversation. Don't just nod your head. Engaging conversation can be engaging. Tell the person that this is uncomfortable for you because it's the first time that you've been in a circumstance where you need to negotiate a price. This is engaging for the other person. Depending on the person, they might take advantage, but it's still honest, which is engaging. Okay? Active listening. So we spoke about that. That is 1,000%. It is super, super important that you get good at active listening. You can do that with a friend or... Um, you, yeah, you can mainly you should practice with a friend or if you're in a relationship, 100%. If you get good at that, you'll have a good relationship. Simple as. But active listening is really, really important, okay? Mentioned earlier, if you're at a party or if you're at a birthday or whatever and you met new people, happens, yeah? So you meet new people, the next day or that evening, write down the people's names, and which I'm terrible at, write down the people's names, but also write down everything you know about them. Don't let anybody see the piece of paper because they'll probably think that you're, gonna, you're like a serial killer or you're watching everybody. But just make sure to see that for yourself. Next day, check it out. Then next party, next birthday, do it again. Check it out. Is it getting better? Are you more conscious of it? And then in a month's time or two weeks time, try it out again. 
you will actually see that you will subconscious, not necessarily subconsciously, but you're starting to train yourself to active listen. This is essential. If you're talking to somebody in a negotiation and you discuss something at the beginning, generally, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but actually, we will be talking about this in a moment. Um, but generally, I will just talk to the person for as long as I like, because I want to learn about the person before I begin a negotiation. If I can refer to things I spoke about at the beginning with the person at the very end of the conversation, the person now hits home that I have been listening to them and I'm actually interested in them. This is very good for relationships, also for further negotiations. Super. Now, questioning. Okay. We mentioned earlier about interrogation, about talk that we spoke about interviews. Like it is so important, so important to make sure that when you're questioning somebody that you're not just um, like asking questions at them, okay? You know, like I'm gonna talk about it in a minute, but just be, be sure to know the difference between talking at them and talking to them, okay? So we'll have a look at that. And also expectation management. The amount of people that get this wrong, even me, I've got this wrong many times and I've got everything else on this list wrong many times. That's one of the reasons that I'm actually quite good at being a coach because I've got so many things incorrect that I can um, guide somebody uh, to make sure that they they don't have to kind of go down the rabbit hole like me. <laughs> uh, but the expectation ones can be something you do need to keep an eye on, okay? This can be changed many, many reasons, or, uh, by many, many reasons, or many, many, uh, different variables or catalysts just just be conscious of expectation management what do you expect to get out of the conversation what is the reason you're having a conversation what may their expectations be okay if it is something that you have very high expectation let's say for instance this is probably a very simple way to i hope to got it isn't it but a simpler way to um do an expectation talk or um expectation management if you have two people okay you have two people in the conversation you have you're dealing with um, two partners, okay? There, there's 50-50 in, in the partnership of a company, okay? You've met one of the partners, fantastic. Don't forget now, 50% each, so half and half. So one can't make a decision without the other, okay? So 100% fully on board for your new uh, drone system for their parcel delivery and their logistics, okay? so. Perfect. You're, you're like absolutely there, like 100% we're buying it. And also you can train all our staff in um, all the different countries. Okay. So meet the next person. You go in and you are like, this is done. This is like 100% they're buying it. No worries. Okay. Confidence is different. But going in there thinking that you have already built up the relationship is incorrect. You should, in my opinion, go in at 5% maybe zero percent and introduce yourself like you did with the person that you got over the line this is essential okay so please be sure to do that now needs analysis um, is also very very uh, important and something you, you should uh, you should identify very early on at how much time you spend when you're doing a needs analysis with somebody so is it is there enough time spent talking to somebody uh, about what they actually need from this negotiation or from the conversation, from the sale or from the upgrade. Um, let's say if it's a career path that you're changing, okay? So this is very, very important. Now, knowing, uh, I'm gonna discuss needs analysis a bit more on the next slide, but know your prospect, okay? Similar to needs analysis, you need to be asking questions to understand the person before you can start making judgment because you're going to preempt something that you might be going well in a conversation and you want to make sure that it's um, it's going very, very well in the sense that you don't uh, assume anything So because you, you can assume something totally incorrectly. Um, but please be sure to, to know your prospect and try not to assume too much without asking the question okay uh, rapport building now rapport building is super important for many reasons like it's similar to knowing your prospect and making sure that you're not just um 
you're not just asking questions at the person just to kind of find out about a profile for them you actually are interested okay you're building a relationship with the person you may want to do business with them in the future so please be sure to make like you know don't let the person feel or don't try to make the person feel like you're just trying to make a profile you do want to build a relationship with them okay you may do a deal with them today and you're doing a negotiation on a certain um, product that you're going to provide for their company or you're going to sell your company to them maybe you want to do this again in the future why burn the bridge build a good relationship at the beginning so you don't need to do it in the future and you can work together in the future fantastic now impact questioning now this is super important in negotiation when you are discussing the outcomes of something happening so the impact if they don't change something so let's say for instance there is um, a product that you're providing so you're providing I should have wrote these down but I'm just trying to think of a product that you're providing and it and it didn't it didn't uh, it didn't say like the product was something that was going to change their logistics like i mentioned earlier about the um the drone so the drone would help the logistics to go to different areas or go to different uh, locations very very easily okay but what is the impact if the person doesn't use this service that you're actually going to provide if they don't use the service that you're going to provide it would be um, maybe something that they need to do in the future, which might cost them money. So this is something that's going to be an impact to their company, and it may have a negative impact. The negative impact is going to help you to get a result, okay? Because you're going to be able to bring it over the line by saying, look, if you go for mine today, you're not going to have that negative impact, and you don't have anything to worry about, okay? Super, super important. Now, next is adaptability okay so altering yourself in the conversation is super super important okay being able to adapt to a scenario but also those things are about practice training for the conversation understanding your prospect understanding your product understanding um the the company i suppose that you're going to be dealing with you know and the expectations that you have, the ups and downs that could happen in the conversation. Be prepared with your conversation and your answers, okay? Know your product that you're trying to provide or know what you're trying to negotiate, okay? There's nothing worse than the person who doesn't and they're trying to negotiate something they don't understand, okay? So just put yourself in the best foot forward for that one. And patience. Something I had to teach myself, uh, I've worked as an artist to do for many years, but it is something that I've learned from mixing paint. Um, it is something I had to learn the hard way when it comes to business, but it is important in negotiation to be patient. It is difficult, but patience works. Like don't rush the conversation. The person will not like if you rush the conversation. So please take your time and do your best to be as patient as possible. Also being eager in a conversation can come across negatively, okay? Now, is there anything else that you would add to the list? Anything at all? If there's anything you would add, please be sure to write it down before we move to the next slide. Super. Okay, let's have a look at the next slide. Okay. So why do we analyze our prospects? Like, why? Is, is, there, is there a reason that we analyze the prospects before we meet them? Do you know, is it the first meeting like we mentioned earlier? Is it the first time you're going to meet them? Is it the first time you're going to have a discussion with them? We need to know this. If not, that's okay. But is it the first time that you met them? Okay, do you need, what do you need to prepare for the conversation? Do we need to plan our dialogue with this particular client? Like, is this client quite difficult to deal with? Yeah, so these are certain questions that will come up that you need to be prepared. Like here, is it to, to have a baseline uh, for the icebreaker conversation? Like, do you know, do you have anything that you know about the client that you can discuss in the first 20 minutes or the first 10 minutes? Do you know? This is going to give you the baseline for your rapport building. Super important. Do we need to plan our dialogue uh, with this particular client? 
uh, is just as important because you might have a super difficult client or the client mightn't be a native English speaker, a native Portuguese, native Spanish speaker, and you're dealing with the client. This is important to make sure that your language is correct. You don't want to steer the client in the wrong direction. Okay. Okay. Super, super important. And also making sure, is it our first meeting or second to that? Is it a second meeting? Is it another person involved in this meeting? Where do you, uh, where do you, where do you research about this client? Like, where do you look up about this client? Do you preempt um, that you're not um, like too sure about them and contact them? Just have a quick call and just say, oh, just confirming rather than sending an email, just confirming a meeting that you send them a contact um, to line up a phone call. Okay, don't be afraid to do these things. These are going to be very, very much to your advantage when it comes down to um, building a rapport and having a good uh, negotiation with the person. Okay. Super. Okay, so let's have a look at the next slide. Okay, so one of the major things like we were talking about there, which was discussing um, the questions that you'd ask yourself. What about the questions that you're going to be asking the different styles of questioning that you need to ask the person. So these are things that you can practice and also things that you should definitely write down. Okay, so I'd like everybody to write these down because this is the bones of the tools that you're going to use when you're asking questions in a negotiation or in a sale or um, uh, in a circumstance that you need to purchase something. Okay, or sell something, I suppose. Um, super. Okay, so let's look at number one. Number one, open and actually, first of all, is there any of these that you understand? If there's any of these that you already understand, please make sure to drop me an email on contactcoachoshe at gmail.com. But first of all, I just want to have a look at open and close, just the first two. Open and closed questions. Open question, if anybody knows. Open question, any question that can be answered with either yes or no, or one word or like a number. So mainly it's just yes or no, okay? Closed question. Any question that can be answered with either yes or no. Okay, so an open question can't be answered with just yes or no. I cannot be answered with yes or no. And a closed question absolutely can. Closed question, yes, no, one word. Open question, much more difficult. Um, let's say, for instance, if I said a closed question to somebody, I said um, a, in an interview, did you um, did you drive to the interview today? Did you drive by car to the city to get to the interview today? Yes, I did. Or you could say, as an open question, can you describe how you got to the office today? And you might say, oh, or can you describe your morning, maybe? Even broader, okay? Okay, super. So now let's look at, so open and close, just briefly, I suppose, yes or no. For a closed question is the answer, but it can't be the answer for an open question. So if you're trying to gain information, which one should you use? Open question. Closed question can be used to clarify. So you can say um, clarification questions at the end of your conversation to make sure the person understands what you're saying and that you understand what they said. Okay. Now, situational questions. Very, very important. A question that is used to understand the prospects, it may not be a prospect, but the prospect's personal situation and help us build a profile and help you build a profile also. So situational, putting the person in a situation. Okay, or sorry, not putting the person in. What is their situation? Okay, what is the prospect's personal situation? So you're putting them in their own. You're trying to find out, okay, do they, um, where do they live? Uh, do they have family members? If... Uh, uh, where they work, how long they work there, who's their friend in work, things like that. You're t depending on what you're trying to sell or what you're trying to learn about the person, but you're learning about their profile. It's almost profiling questions, but it is very, very important and should be used to your advantage to gain a profile. So like when I think about situational questions, I think about uh, if you remember the game Sims. Sims was a game that they used 
um but i think a lot of us used but uh, it was a bit of crack but that is super important because that was like very much you profile the person you make a character you build a family and then you build a family's friends and neighbors and so on this is their situation okay they have jobs and so on okay this is the situation so this is where you learn to build your profile um with almost profiling questions okay now probing super important uh, a follow-up question this is like we said before you need to make sure the person is listening I'm sorry, you need to make sure that the person knows you're listening to them, okay? So probing, what is probing? It's a follow-up question to gain more information that we may have uh, been given to our first question, okay? So say, for instance, um, uh, you're asking something about um, their last employment. You're doing an interview with somebody and say, Oh, okay. So, uh, where did you last? Where did you last work? Uh, I worked in a medical factory. Okay. Um, and do you mind me asking, um, what was your favorite part about working in the medical factory? Oh, it was really enjoyable because I was able to make products that were very helpful for people. Perfect. So, is this something that you do enjoy, um, building products, or um, or is it helping people? And then they might go into something else. But I'm still discussing something about the same topic. Um, is there other medical companies that you know of that are doing a similar product? So, you know, I'm still asking about the same thing. I'm not like, oh, where did you last work? Perfect. And what age you? Okay. And what did you have for breakfast? All these things have no relationship. Okay. So it's very important to have a follow-up question to show that you have intent with what you're asking. You care about what they're going to answer and you also care about the subject matter. Really, really important. For me, so much uh, emphasis should be put on understanding and utilizing probing questions very very good for active listening now also paraphrase express uh, the meaning of the word the speaker using different words especially to achieve greater clarity okay so express the meaning of the speaker using different words so let's say for instance somebody says a really long sentence which you will find a lot in a negotiation um sometimes people will go on and they'll ramble about something and then you may need to ask a question to clarify what the whole point of this massive ramble was. Uh, and it's very, very common to do that. Okay, so express the meaning of the speaker using different words, especially to achieve a greater clarity. Okay, super. Happy enough with that? Excellent. So paraphrasing is also good. And it's not just good for you to clarify what they've said so that they can hear, oh, this guy is listening to me. You're saying it out loud to make sure you know. Oh, um, so what you're saying is blah, 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 blah. And then they might say, actually, not really. So they're just clarifying a bit of an angle on what you said. But at least you're not leaving the conversation with different information. So that you're actually making sure, okay, I understand what they've said. Okay, very, very good. Super. Any questions, like I said, make sure you've written them down. If you haven't tracked the questions you've been doing already, make sure that you revisit to make sure if we have answered them already okay super now the next thing i would like to talk about is these last three questions okay so this is the second part of questioning uh, it's on slide two the first one is reflective questioning okay this is very good to encourage the person that you're dealing with to think about something something about how they feel to reflect on something okay we have your intent yeah so it just says uh, it's in, intent is to get the person uh, receiving the question to think about something okay very very important we need to know how they feel about something so if this was to happen how would that make you feel if you um decided um, or sorry, something that they've decided in the past, maybe a different negotiation. What did it make you feel? I hope you enjoyed today. Was there something else that um, um, in the past where you've had a conversation that was a bit different to today's meeting? Oh, yes. And then they explain something and you're like, okay, well, this is definitely not something I'm going to do because it pissed off my client or my prospect. <laughs> so just be conscious of that. Reflective is super, super important. Um, and it's very good to um, be good at tone of voice for that scenario as well. Okay. Then hypothetical. So hypothetical. It's a what if question. So I'm just reading here now. So a what if question, super important. It can be used to create scenarios with the client or prospect. This will help you in understanding their thought process. Okay. 
so what if so god forbid or what if what if you dis, if this happened what if that happened uh what if you didn't have this would you upgrade what if in the future you don't have this what happens okay so these are what if questions very very useful for doing an analysis about the need of the client okay same with the reflective very important and also then we have impact questions now we mentioned these briefly earlier impact question is uh, this can be used when discussing the impact of a problem if not fixed by the client or prospect okay impact question so we mentioned earlier if you're getting to the close of a conversation you're trying to get the purchase you've been working on it for six months eight months ten months you're trying to get the close and the deadline is coming up where you need to get the person to purchase so you can start discussing things about oh things that they really like and they really love and they're like oh i'm not sure it's like perfect okay so let's minus the things that you really like and you don't have them going forward in the future are you going to be still satisfied and the customer's like absolutely not perfect okay so i don't understand why you're not purchasing because these are things you're not going to have if you don't purchase and these are things you've just told me that you like is that true absolutely perfect let's go ahead so impact questions very very successful when you use them in the right way don't be rude when you're using them if you don't have this have this use them in the right way but just understand that the customer might need to be kind of um you may need to discuss an impact question rather than just ask an impact question like i find that it's very important to kind of say okay so as we've discussed am i like paraphrasing almost am i correct in saying that you've said that you really really like this you're not really 100 percent on this but you do really may want to make sure that you get this in the future and they're like absolutely i was like perfect okay so what is holding you back do you know is it is it the price of whatever you're purchasing um because i do believe that this is quite valuable to you perfect what is the loss if you don't get this oh there's a huge loss okay perfect what is the gain oh there's a massive gain okay <laughs> then what's the what's the decision problem <laughs> do you know so it really depends but the impact one is very very powerful if used in the right way okay on the practical day we do practice these questions okay so yeah, make sure if you get a chance to sign up for the practical day and it's generally for two to three days depending on the country. All right, uh, so let's jump ahead. Super, okay, so we're getting close to, one second, close to kind of the bones of the needs analysis part and kind of the kind of underlying bones of the conversation when you're doing a negotiation. So need origin impact and benefit okay so what are those things about okay so the need of the client so we've discussed this already what is the need uncover the customer or the client or the prospect their need uh, using situational questions and probing so we mentioned situational questions understand the customer understand the client or the prospect who are they what are they about what's their profile we mentioned profiling questions for clarity and detail that's what you're going to gain you're going to gain clarity you're going to gain detail from doing this right now, use uh, emotive questions, okay? So emotive questioning to help the customer think about their vulnerabilities and uh, what they are, okay? So we need to use that. We need to find out what their do's and don'ts, what they want for the future, what they, you know, what's going to motivate them, okay? So you're going to find these out in the needs analysis, okay? So using the questioning styles we discussed, that's where you're going to use them at the beginning of this process here. Now, on the right, we have origin. Where do, so just here underneath, uh, origin, you say, where do the vulnerabilities come from? Okay, so where do they originate? So then when you're talking to the customer, be sure to ask enough questions to find out about where these come from, okay? Take your time, understand this person's a human being. They do like to be talked to, chat to them, okay? Don't just be worried about them being a client or a prospect for the future. Discuss things with them. Now, family safety um, from break-ins, from fire, from uh, depending on the country that you're in, you might have damage to animals. You might have uh, different things that they're worried about. Okay, we want to make sure that we can provide things to their need, or they might have worried about their financial circumstance or uh, loss of business. It's depending. Knowledge of increased break-ins in the area and different reasons. Okay. It is important to like different break-ins or kind of people losing um, finance, finances or break into the building or, you know, it just really depends on what you're actually selling to the person. 
but just be aware that it's really important to find out the origin of where their need to purchase might be. Now, let's look at impact. Where are the potential consequences if they don't solve that problem? So let's say they have a problem. So here we have knowledge of increased break-ins in the area. So let's say, for instance, they're a new business owner. They're worried, like, uh, at the moment, I'm working from... Um, and Brazil, so people have a huge problem with this, which knowledge of break-ins, not enough security on the premises, and they're worried and so on. Okay, so and maybe like they don't have uh, a lot of people have uh, weapons here, and they may have a weapon in that in the in the shop. It's very difficult actually to talk about Brazil. We're not talking in Portuguese, but let's say they do not have a weapon in the shop. They haven't applied for their license to have a weapon and so on. So they're just quite nervous, you know. So this might be a key reason they want to get your product because your product is maybe, I don't know, maybe they're renting motorbikes and they they are just quite worried that they're going to get stolen. So maybe you provide a tracking device that can be tracked all over Brazil on an app of a phone, you know. Okay, so it really depends. So what is the potential of the consequence if they don't solve the problem? Well, maybe somebody's going to take the bike and they can't get the back. Okay, simple. Now, that's just a simple circumstance, but, but who knows, okay? And then for the benefit, okay, here's how we can help. So this is what you're going to provide. You're going to find the problem that they've discussed with you or that your, 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 your need, your real need or the niche that you're going to kind of latch onto for them to purchase something. And then... Here is how you're going to help. So you're going to provide a, a, a solve, a, like a solvent. Okay, so Mr. And Mrs. Customer, or um, if you're talking about the, the CEO or the management team or who you're selling something to or who you're negotiating with, uh, you need to introduce your, your, your features of what you're providing, the benefit that you're going to give them. That's what the, the FBI is. And the imagery, how it's going to look when they have what you're providing. Now, to help us link features to need. And this is what is going to help you do that 100%. Okay. So just be sure to concentrate on the impact questions as best possible, but mainly understanding the customer for 100%. Before you do anything, make sure you spend some time to understand that client. Okay. Any questions on this slide, please feel free to drop me an email on contactcoachoshea at gmail.com. Um, but yeah, I hope that we can now just have a quick look back at the expectations that you had for today. I know some people have sent me messages um, in the past and just kind of talking about different things that they expected to gain from the course. Now, some of the stuff that I talk about is gen generally it's a toolbox for you to be better in the case of a negotiation. It's not um, as specific as some courses because if it was, it would be very difficult for you to kind of have tools. Like if it was something about selling a certain product or selling a certain, uh, selling courses or selling, you know, selling marketing or whatever for negotiation or even a relationship stuff. It's all very specific. This is a bit more broad, so it can be used in a lot more circumstances for you guys. But if there is any questions, like I said, please drop me an email and ask me. Um, I hope that you've gained a lot of notes and also that you have the PDF that was provided. If not, also uh, ask or myself or one of the team and we will send you out the PDF of the language that you, you provide, or sorry, that you need for, um, for reviewing the notes on the course. Also, if you wish to add yourself into the the practical day, please um, please do. And in the last email you would receive, there's a button there you can click on, uh, which will let you join into the waiting list onto one of our courses for the live events. They're like two or three days. Super. Uh, so finally, I just want to say thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate you guys being here and getting better at negotiation. It is something that takes time. Don't think it's going to happen overnight. Like I mentioned at the beginning, it is something that you need to work on. It is something that you can train and you can go to one of our days or one of our training days and we can actually help you much better actually one-to-one -one. Um, or you can uh, book a call. But just think not to change everything tomorrow. Okay, you just need to understand it better tomorrow. That's much, much uh, better position to be in. Um, but yeah, I hope you had a great day. Uh, my own name is Kevin O'Shea, and I would just like to say thank you very much and have a great day. And yeah, I hope to see you very, very soon.